Hello everyone, this is Charlie from the Bloomingdale Public Library and welcome to Beginning Gaming with Raspberry Pi. Today we're going to talk about how to turn a Raspberry Pi into a retro Pi, which will help us play video games from 20 years ago and further back. You can do modern day computer gaming on a Raspberry Pi, keeping in mind that it runs on Linux. However, because of the modest CPU and lack of a discrete GPU, you're going to have a kind of limited experience. If you're watching this, you probably know what a Raspberry Pi is, but in case you don't, it's a small, inexpensive computer that goes for $35. There's older models, trimmed down models, and beefed up models that'll go for a little more and a little less. There is a ship shortage going on right now, so availability is extremely limited. And also that $35 doesn't include some of the other things that you'll need to get up and running. However, you can usually find reasonably priced kits that'll include some of those pieces. So the Raspberry Pi is a product of the Raspberry Pi Foundation, which is headquartered in the United Kingdom, and is designed primarily for educational purposes in developing countries, basically for helping impoverished kids learn how to code. I suspect, uh, seeing some of the improvements on the later generations, that that focus might have changed a little bit, though. The recommended operating system for a standard Raspberry Pi is Raspberry Pi OS, formerly known as Raspbian. Uh, it highly resembles Windows and functions a lot like it, uh, unless you need to do some more advanced computing. Um, there's also usually a bunch of programs included to learn how to code. The Raspberry Pi also has something called GPIO pins, which stands for General Purpose Input Output, which will help us work with circuits so you can interact with things like motors and sensors. And in that respect, it's very similar to an Arduino, if you know what an Arduino is. However, the functionality of an Arduino is completely different. It is not a fully functioning computer, but it is a lot more effective at just reading sensors and turning on motors and things like that. So there are a bunch of models of the Raspberry Pi, which we'll look at in just a sec. The newer ones tend to have better specs, and there's usually RAM upgrades available now as well. If you want to learn more, I highly recommend you go to raspberrypi.com. Just have a look at some of the different iterations of a Raspberry Pi. The one that you're usually looking for is the third from the left here, the Raspberry Pi 4 Model B. If you have trouble finding that, you can go back to the Raspberry Pi 3 Model B Plus. It'll be similar but not quite the same. Uh, anything lower or further back than that, and you might have a less uh, smooth experience, especially with some of the later systems included in the Retro Pi. So to the right of that is a trimmed down Model A Plus. Again, this is uh, from the third generation. You'll notice that there's a lot less ports available. Then you have the Pi Zero, which has even fewer. You're relying a little bit more on Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. And then on the far left, you have a Raspberry Pi 400 unit, which is basically a Pi 4 embedded within a keyboard case. So these are all considered Raspberry Pis. They all run the same uh, operating system. However, they all have different levels of functionality and higher or lower specs. So now that we know what a Raspberry Pi is, we can discuss what a Retro Pi is which is basically just a Raspberry Pi configured to function like a gaming console for older video games. In other words, we don't need any new hardware, and we don't need to do anything to the existing hardware, and the software all runs on top of Raspberry Pi OS. So the Retro Pi project is a collaboration of many other projects providing software to emulate old video game consoles with a simple interface designed for controller input. It used to be back in the day, you'd have to hunt all your emulators down one by one, configure them one by one, uh, figure out a way to organize all your games and emulators and save states. And with the RetroPie project, they do that all for you. So everything is included. You don't need anything besides a controller for the interface. And once you configure the controller the first time, it's set for all the other consoles, unless you wanted to do some customization, which you can. You can do a lot of uh, customizations with the RetroPie interface as well. Uh, for that, you will probably need a keyboard for though, and we're not going to get into that today. 
Although if you want to go roaming around the internet, you can see what other people have done, and it's actually pretty remarkable. If you want to learn more, you can go to retropie.org.uk. So what do we need to build our RetroPie? The first thing is a computer with the internet, and that's to download our RetroPie image for the micro SD card. We will need a micro SD card, which will be the hard drive for the RetroPie. It's recommended, you, recommended to use at least eight gigabytes, but more gigabytes will hold more games, and faster is better. It used to be recommended that you get at least a class 10, but if you see something with a number inside of a U or a V followed by a bunch of numbers, that will be at least as fast, although any speed will work. Of course, you will need a micro SD card reader to put the image onto the SD card. Um, if you don't have a card reader built into your computer, you can usually get one for about $5. Otherwise, they'll come with the, the Raspberry Pi kits that you can get. Of course, you'll need a Raspberry Pi as well. Uh, I recommend at least a Model 3B. If you go any earlier than that, you're going to have trouble playing games from the late 90s on. Um, I personally have played PlayStation games on a Model 3, and it got extremely hot. So bear that in mind. You're going to need a display with an HDMI port, a monitor, television, or projector will do. You'll need an HDMI cable. Uh, if you're using a Raspberry Pi 4, you'll need a micro HDMI to HDMI cable. <clears throat> and then you'll also need a cable uh, for power, which will be micro USB or USB-C, depending on if it's a Raspberry Pi 4 or earlier. Uh, you want to be connecting to the wall for power, so if you need an adapter, then you'll need that as well. You do not want to power up through a computer. In fact, I haven't even tried it, so I'm not sure what will happen, if it'll work at all. Of course, you'll also need controllers as well to play and to navigate on your RetroPie. Some other things that are recommended but not required are a USB drive. We will be using a USB drive to uh, install games, but you can also connect your RetroPie to the internet. I won't be discussing that today. I recommend a case for the Raspberry Pi. In case you haven't noticed, a Raspberry Pi is just a naked PCB board, and it is susceptible to all sorts of damage. So I'd recommend getting a case and make sure it has some ventilation because, like I said, playing some of the later games can get extremely hot. Uh, a keyboard, if you plan on doing any extra cu customization of the interface. Um, remember, everything is built on top of a Raspberry Pi OS, and if you need to do something a little more intricate, you're going to need to interface with a keyboard to use the command line. Headphones or speakers, if you want to use sound, if you don't get something out through the HDMI cable. And you'll need internet access if you want to use your RetroPie online, which again, I'm not going to be discussing today. If you have everything you need, then we're ready to get started. Step one is insert the micro SD card into the computer. Again, this computer will need internet access and a way to interface with that micro SD card. After you put the card in, you'll probably get windows like you see here on the right where it wants to format the card. You can go ahead and close that. Uh, the process of imaging is going to take care of that for us. And again, remember, if we're formatting, anything on that micro SD card is going to get wiped. Step two, install the Raspberry Pi imager. It used to be that you'd have to download a Raspberry Pi image, download another program, and then use that program to put the image onto the micro SD card. But nowadays, we can take care of both at the same time. So what you do is you go to the raspberrypi.com slash software webpage. You should see a screen kind of like the one we have on the left here. Download the imager for the appropriate operating system and then go ahead and run the installer, and you should wind up at a screen like we see here on the right. If you don't, you'll just have to open the program manually. Next step is to write the image to the card. Let's go ahead and click Choose OS. You'll see a window like we have on the left here. Choose Emulation and Game OS. Choose RetroPie, and then pick your model of Raspberry Pi from the list. After that, you'll need to choose storage. 
you should see a window like the one on the left here. If you don't see anything, it means your card is probably not seated correctly. If you see more than one, make sure you're choosing the micro SD card that you intend to overwrite with the image. Once you click write, you'll get a confirmation window here that says everything's about to be wiped. And once you confirm, you should see a progress window like we see here on the right. It took me about two or three minutes, but your mileage will probably vary depending on your hardware, what kind of micro SD card you have, and what kind of USB port you're using. Once you're done, you'll probably see that format window come up again. Go ahead and close that. Take the micro SD card out, and then you plug it into the Pi. The micro SD card reader on the Raspberry Pi is on the bottom, so just go ahead and flip it, push it in at the orientation you see here, and it should click into place. Once that's all set, go ahead and connect all your peripherals. Uh, if you have a monitor or speakers that need to be turned on, go ahead and turn those on. Uh, if something is not connected or turned on, the Raspberry Pi might not recognize it once you power it up. Um, I had issues getting sound working on mine because I, put, I plugged in the speakers after I had turned on the Raspberry Pi and the Raspberry Pi just wasn't seeing it. So then go ahead and power up the Pi. There is no power on button, you just have to plug it in. Uh, with that said, you do want to turn it off through the software. Otherwise, if you just unplug the Raspberry Pi while it's still turned on, it's probably going to corrupt your micro SD card eventually. You should get lights on, like you see in the bottom right here. The red one is the power button. The green one is the activity one. So again, if you're not seeing any lights, there's probably an issue with your power delivery. With everything plugged in and turned on, you should see a bunch of loading screens. You'll see some text flying by. You'll see a, a rainbow square come up. Uh, you'll probably see the RetroPie splash screen as well. But once all that flows through, it should bring us to a welcome screen like we have on the left here. Um, if you're using a USB controller like I am, it should be detected. It's recognized everything that I've used so far. Go ahead and hold down a button and it'll take us to the configuring screen, like we see here. Go ahead and press the button for each assignment. Uh, if you wanted to skip one, just hold down any button and it'll skip it. So for like an older console, you wouldn't need to configure the joysticks if that's all you're going to be using. Keep in mind you will need a hotkey in order to interact with the operating system while you're playing a game. Uh, and if you don't have one assigned, it's going to use whatever you use as select by default. On my controller, I didn't have enough buttons, so that's what I did. And once you're done configuring, it'll take us to a screen like we have on the right, and we're good to go. Now that you have a RetroPie up and running, it's time to install some games. But first, there's two concerns that I need to bring to your attention. The first one is that there's some legal questions around acquiring ROMs that you should be aware of and research on your own. And ROMs is just another term for video game files in the emulation world. This is a nuanced topic that I would like to discuss at length, but it's beyond the scope of the video, so I'm going to restrain myself. In practice, you shouldn't have any problems building up your game collection unless you try to make money from it. The second concern is that downloading ROMs is generally safe, but you still need to be vigilant. ROM sharing harkens back to an early age of the internet when file sharing was a lot more common, albeit still not nearly 100% safe. So stick to the major ROM sites and scan your files for viruses after downloading them and you should be okay. And it's because of these two concerns that I'm not going to demonstrate downloading games or make any recommendations for ROM websites. But if you do a web search for trusted ROM sites, you'll see a lot of people with their own lists of their favorites and the same half dozen or so will be at the top of most people's lists, and I would stick to those. So for installing games, the first thing we need to do is to prepare a USB drive. Uh, go ahead and plug a USB drive into a computer, and in Windows you would go to File Explorer and right-click on the USB drive, and it'll bring up a pop-up menu like this guy here on the left. Choose Properties from the bottom, 
and it'll bring up this window here, and near the top it'll say file system, and you want to make sure this says FAT32 or XFAT. If it says NTFS or something else, this drive isn't going to work for installing the games onto the RetroPie. So you'd have to use another drive, or you can format this one. In order to format a USB drive, go ahead and right-click on the USB drive again in File Explorer. Choose Format near the middle of the menu. It'll bring up this window here. Make sure FAT32 is selected from the file system. And click Start. If you need to format the drive, it's going to delete everything on there. Otherwise, you can actually leave everything else there. The whole process of installing games isn't going to overwrite anything that's already on the flash drive, or USB drive rather. So once we have the USB drive formatted properly, go ahead and create a new folder at the root of the drive and call it RetroPie. And for that you can either click on the empty space, right click, select new, select folder, and go ahead and rename it. Or you can click on new folder, in the ribbon at the top underneath the home tab. So once you have your folder, go ahead and remove the USB drive from the computer and put it in the RetroPie and leave it for about a minute. You'll notice the activity life flickering and once it stops for a couple seconds, go ahead and pull it out. And what it was doing, it was creating a folder structure for all the consoles that the RetroPie supports. So now, Go ahead and put the USB drive back into a computer that has to have an internet connection. Go to a ROM site, download the ROM for the game that you want. It'll probably be a zip or .7z file. And then you would move the ROM file to the proper folder on the USB drive. So you can see at the right, if you open up that RetroPie folder, and then in that folder there's gonna be three folders, Go ahead and open up the one that says ROMs, and then it'll have a folder for all the consoles that are supported on the RetroPie. So if you have a ROM for an NES game, you would take that file and put it under the folder that says NES. So once you have your ROM file in the proper folder on the USB drive, go ahead and pull the USB drive back out of the computer and put it into the RetroPie. From here, you got to wait for the game to sync with the RetroPie, and how long that takes depends on how big the game is, what model of Raspberry Pi you have. But again, if you keep your eye on the activity lights, once it stops, you're probably done. And from there, you would go ahead and hit start on your controller, go to quit, and then restart emulation station, and when everything comes back up, you should see any consoles with games installed magically appear in the main menu here. And then if you select that console, you'll see the ROM in that menu. With your controller configured and your games installed, playing games is just a matter of selecting the console from the main screen and then choosing a game from the console's menu. Once you do that, you'll probably see a little bit of text as the emulator boots up, and that'll bring you to the title screen of the game you're trying to play. Now once you're within the game, you need a way to interact with the system, and that's done with hotkeys. You can see the hotkey combinations over here on the right. So you'd use the hotkey plus start to exit a game, hotkey plus B to merely reset the game, and then you have a whole bunch of other options here for save states. And if you don't know what save states are, they're a lot of fun with the older consoles. It, it's an easier way to save and load your games without worrying about passwords or save points. So I'll let you experiment with that on your own. Remember the hotkey is what you assigned it to in the controller configuration menu. And if you didn't actually configure one, it defaults to the select button. So you would use select start to exit a game and go back to the main menu. When you're all done gaming, it's time to turn the RetroPie off. And to do that, you first want to make sure you're out of any game by again doing hotkey plus start. Hit start again to get to the main menu over here on the left screen. Choose quit, which takes you over here to the quit menu on the right. 
and select shutdown system. Once the lights turn off, you're good to take out the micro SD card or unplug the RetroPie from the wall. So that's all I have for you. I hope you found it entertaining and informative. And if you are looking to do a little bit more configuring and customization, there's a lot of resources available to you all over the internet and a very active community of people that will help you. So with that, I wish you good luck and thank you for viewing. <music>